move on to the very last topic. We just have just half an hour to skim it. Not sure that uh, it's very useful to go through this in such a short time. Um, but anyway, let me just do this to point out to you some of the uh, terms that are available and to uh, get you started on further reading. You may not understand everything in such a short overview. So first, I have been using this term decision support, decision support systems uh, regularly. What are decision support systems? They are not meant for processing transactions. They are not meant for selling tickets or, uh, you know, uh, maybe it, uh, updating your bank account and so forth. They are used to make business decisions based on a lot of data which is out there. Typically retail sales data, phone call data, plus other data about a customer, plus these days maybe uh, search uh, terms that people are using on web. You know, Google will happily sell search terms to people who want to buy it to uh, find out what people are querying about their product and so forth. What kind of business decisions? All kinds of things. What items to manufacture? What items to stock? How much premium to charge for insurance, etc. So, decision supports have various aspects. There's a data analysis uh, aspect. You know. Once the data is there, how do you do analysis? A typical way is to look at different aggregates and analysts will look at it and eyeball it and decide what to do. And typically they will look at some aggregate, look at other aggregates to try to understand why this aggregate changed this way. You know, sales fell in this quarter. Why did that happen? What would be an explanation for it? So they kind of explore the data to find out what happened. Uh, then there are other ways to do it. Uh, statistical packages, uh, S plus, uh, there, are, there are many packages out there which can be used on top of these. We are not going to get into it. Then there is data mining, where the goal is that you don't have an analyst who is, uh, you know, kind of exploring the data, but you tell the system, look for patterns and tell me occurrences of certain kinds of patterns. There are many kinds of patterns, clustering, association rule, and so forth. Uh, and then there are other kinds of things which are used to make decisions such as, um, you know, I have some information about a customer based on information about earlier customers, you know, uh, how much premium do I charge this customer for insurance? Uh, so that's another kind of thing which where data mining is useful. Then there's this term data warehouse. What is a warehouse? It's basically a system which archives information gathered from potentially from many sources and stores it in a unified way at a single site. So a large company may have many operational databases, one for uh, its uh, division X, one for its division Y, and so forth, one for geography A, one for geography B. So a data warehouse collects this from all the sources and puts it together in a single schema. There's also external sources of data. Like I said, uh, you can buy it from search companies, you can buy it from market survey organizations and many others. So a data a warehouse stores uh, data, which is also historical, not just today's data, but the last year, two years, three years of data. So data warehouse is a repository of such information. Now here is roughly how a data warehouse operates. There are many data sources and the data warehouse has data loaders which take data from these sources. They may be in different formats. It uh, brings it to a common format. Um, sometimes there can be errors in some data sources. It tries to clean up the errors, remove things which are uh, clearly wrong. If somebody's age is given as 900, it's clearly wrong. It's going to be removed. And uh, some other such cleanup. Uh, and then uh, it pa puts it in a database in a unified schema. Now from this schema, you have query and analysis tools running off that. Now what kind of schemas are used here? It turns out that the normalized schemas which we have focused on with ER design and so on are not actually appropriate for data warehouses. Here no updates are happening except data which you are sucking in from other places. Uh, there is no major issue with inconsistency. And what you want is efficiency. And typically what happens is you have large fact table with uh, many dimensions. Um, I think I have a picture of it here. Okay, so a company uh, which is 
selling stuff, they want to analyze their sales. So, they have a sales table, which is usually a very large table. It has something like, um, you know, here was this item sold in this store to this customer on this date, how many units and what was the price. This is actually simplified, there may be a few more fields. But note that there are many fields here which are uh, identifiers, item ID. Okay, that's actually um, an index into some other table which has the item. Now, usually the item table is smaller than the sales table. This may be pretty big. You know, Amazon stores millions of items, Flipkart probably hundreds of thousands of items. Um, but the sales is much larger than the list of items. Uh, along with item ID, you have things like name, color, size, category, and so on. And your aggregate query might want to see sales by category, sales by color, and so on, grouped by various attributes here. Similarly, you have date, and date has uh, associated with it fields like month, quarter, year. Now, note that all of these are redundant. From the date, you can compute all of these, uh, but it is still stored for efficiency. Uh, similarly, you have store ID with city, state, country, customer ID with various information. This is a typical thing where there are a lot of foreign keys from the central fact table to a number of surrounding tables, which are called dimension tables. So, this kind of a schema is called a star schema. Uh, so, in the simplest cases, there is just one large fact table, but there are uh, domains where you have multiple, a few fact tables, you, usually not too many. Uh, for analysis, these are the kind of schemas which are most relevant. There are many other things which you may not bother about in analysis, you throw them out. There are many other schemas in the OLTP system which might get folded into one thing here. So, customer, there may be many things, relationships, you know, which may get folded in here in some way. So, that was a super quick look at what a data warehouse is. It is not a deep look at all, a super shallow look. Um, but there are many issues in data warehousing as to uh, how to load data, how to, what schema should you use, how to optimize queries running on it, how to pre-compute aggregates so that queries will run faster and so forth. The next topic which we will brush upon very quickly is data mining. So, roughly speaking, data mining is the process of semi-automatically analyzing large databases to find useful patterns. So, there are several kinds of tasks which can be done as part of data mining. One is prediction. This is one of the very important tasks. So, if somebody has applied for a job, somebody has applied for a loan, somebody has applied uh, for admission, how do you decide whether to admit? to uh, admit them, to give them a job, and so forth. Now, for some of these, there are human intuition and so on play a role, uh, but that can be fickle. Instead, if you had a lot of prior data about people, and uh, based on that, you can predict whether this person is likely to pay back the loan on time or is likely to pay back the loan, but not on time and pay us large uh, fees, uh, interest and late fees, but is still going to pay back eventually, or is likely to default and run away and leave us with uh, unpaid loan. So, these are the kinds of things which you want to predict. And a credit card company loves the second type of customer. The first type is okay, they are not losing money. The second type, they are making tons of money because that person pays interest on credit card debts. And the third type who runs away totally, they do not want because then they lose money. So, how do you predict this based on various attributes, income, job, age, gender, uh, where they live, there are so many other factors. Okay, so, that is one kind of thing. Another kind of uh, use of data mining is for classification. So, I want to uh, group items in some way and given a new item, predict to which class it belongs and we will see some of this later. And then there is a variant of it which is regression formulae, which is I want to compute a number uh, through some method. So, for example, the prediction earlier, right, it could be predicting by predicting whether this person is in bin A, bin B or bin C, three categories. Or it could be a number, a credit score, which is a number which between uh, 0 and 1, let us say. In that case, it is a regression formula. And there are other types too. There are associations. 
if you have gone to any uh, bookstore site such as Amazon, or now Amazon is any, it's not just books, it's everything. Um, so, they look for associations. So, if you search for a particular book, they will say people who bought this book also bought these other books, or people who search for these books ended up purchasing this other thing. So, maybe you want to take a look at that also. So, these are associations. Um, there are other kinds of associations which say that um, you know people who bought item X also bought item Y. Now, in the case of the shop, their goal was to suggest other things which you might find interesting. But in other cases like retail shops, uh, if they find out that people who buy item X are also likely to buy item Y, then they may uh, do something about that. They may uh, put up a thing in the banner in the store uh, in this section saying, hey, we have a sale on this other thing, this other section, go check it out. There are many other things they can do to drive sales. So, a lot of this is uh, driven by how to increase sales. It can also be the first step in detecting causation. So, there is an association between living in this part of the city and having uh, say tuberculosis. Now, is that a uh, cause of tuberculosis? Maybe, maybe not, but you could uh, maybe that is showing a pattern and you may want to look deeper into it. Maybe the pollution there is very high and that is causing tuberculosis. And another way of doing that is to look for clusters. Instead of association between location, clustering is when you have a map and you say that this region of the map, there are lots of cases of uh, typhoid and that may be because of contaminated water over there. And you might respond by going and fixing the water mains there. Um, so, uh, all these were different types of data mining. Now, for the first task which is classification, you could create rules. So, the rules could be like um, for all person P, if the degree is masters and income greater than 75,000, credit is excellent. This is an example of a classification rule. Then there can be other such rules. Now, who comes up with this rule? It could be a human, but the goal here is to automatically infer these rules. And um, there is a decision tree. So, the rules can be represented as a decision tree. So, the decision tree starts on some attribute in degree here and has multiple branches. So, you have a bachelor's degree and your income is 50, uh, this should have been, uh, I think some thing is messed up here. This should have been great less than 50 k. Then maybe your uh, credit rating is bad. If it is greater than or equal to 50 k, it is considered good. On the other hand, if you have a doctorate and your income is low, you might still be considered good because uh, your the assumption is uh, you are a poor professor, uh, but you are an honest person even though you may be poor. Whereas, this other poor guy may not be as honest. Anyway, how did you come up with these rules? Like I said, based on old data, uh, you want to, uh, there are algorithms for coming up with decision trees. That is one kind of classifier. There are many other types of classifiers, neural nets, Bayesian, support vector machines. Some of these are covered in the book. Association rules, uh, I already mentioned, I am going to skip the details. Clustering, also I think we are kind of out of time. I am going to skip those. They are standard things which many of you would already know about. Uh, but let me mention a few other things which are more recent. Hex mining is an area which has taken off in the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, what is uh, text mining? It is basically applying data mining techniques to textual documents. For example, you have a number of web pages, you want to cluster web pages uh, to find uh, pages which fall in some categories and uh, you know, you may, the classification could be useful for many purposes. Maybe you want to cluster uh, pages that a user has visited to organize their visit history. So, I want to search in my history, I knew, I know I looked at some page related to PostgreSQL some time back, but I have looked at many other sites. If the system can cluster it, I can say, you know, find me things in the cluster where PostgreSQL appears and then I can see only that part of my history. Um, I may also classify web pages into a directory. There are many more applications here. So, I should mention that this area 
like I said, took off in the last 10, 15 years. And one of the leading people in this area uh, who wrote probably the first textbook uh, on this topic, uh, in particular web, not just text mining, but text mining and its connection to web, that is textual data on the web, uh, was uh, Professor Soumyan Chakravarti, who is my colleague in this department. He, he has got a textbook on this area, which has been used widely across the world. So that brings me to information retrieval, which is actually Soumyan's core area, uh, web information retrieval. So all of you have used web search engines. You're all familiar with uh, keyword search on the web. Every person from a child now knows about it. But if you go back to 1995, hardly anybody knew about it. The first web search engines uh, were debuting around that time, 94, 95. Um, so uh, it turns out that web search may have come at that time, but information retrieval is a much older area. It's at least uh, dates back to 1960s. It's that old. And back then, they didn't have web, but they had text documents. So it was an important area for a very long time. And the idea was that you uh, give keywords and get back relevant documents. Now note that we are not running SQL queries on these. There is no structure. Documents are just text. So without having any structure, we still want to find relevant documents. So that's what information retrieval has been about. These days, there has been uh, work on uh, merging these scenarios where, you know, on the one end, you had only keyword queries on uh, textual data with no structure. On the other side, you had structured data with only SQL queries. Now, people have been trying to mix these two. For example, there was work uh, which uh, was done at several places, including IIT Bombay, um, where we said, can we issue keyword queries on uh, relational databases and get some meaningful answers out of it. What does it mean to get an answer to a keyword query on a relational database? So this is a paper which uh, uh, Soumyan, I, and some students uh, wrote about uh, 11 years ago. And that paper was at the right place at the right time, and it has got a lot of notice across the world, and uh, there have been a lot of citations to that particular paper. Uh, so that, that is an area which caught people's imagination because, like I said, it was the right place at the right time. Uh, so there are many uh, uh, th ways in which information retrieval and databases are combining today. There is also the other direction. Can you extract structure from unstructured data and then use structured query languages to, structure inf uh, to query information which originally was in textual documents? That's also a very active area. So anyway, that is uh, what information retrieval is about. There are differences. IR systems don't deal with any transactions at all. Uh, they don't really deal with structured data. It's mostly unstructured. Um, but they do many things which database systems didn't do. Approximate searching by keywords. Ranking of retrieved answers by estimated degree of relevance. These are very important. Okay, so these are things which all of us know. Google succeeded because it did a fantastic job of ranking results. The things which you wanted was mostly in the top few. If, many of you may not know it, but Google was not the first search engine. There were three or four companies before Google, and they all got wiped out. They don't exist today. Okay, some of them got bought out by others. But they all got wiped out simply because Google did a much better job than the others. Of course, other, uh, some of the others which came later, in fact, like Bing, um, and some of the existing ones did improve, and they caught up with Google. Okay, so now, um, how do you even decide what things are relevant to a particular query? So I type some keywords. How do you know what is relevant to it? And there are uh, some very basic things which are used. The first is what is called term frequency, which is a measure of how uh, relevant is uh, this word to this document. At one level, you can say it's how many times does the keyword occur in the document. But in a deeper sense, it is, you know, if it is in the title, then it's more important for that document. Even if it occurs five times in the end of the document, that may be less important than occurring in the title. So term frequency is a measure of how relevant is this term to this document. So if I have a, you know, home page of uh, Soumyan Chakravarti, Soumyan and Chakravarti are very important for that page. Uh, 
but if there is a some mention in there that uh, he went to VLDB in Singapore, it is mentioned, but it is not so important. The next is inverse document frequency. So, given a query with 5 keywords, supposing I give something like uh, the or some other keywords like that, which occur very frequently, most search engines uh, would not give much importance to that particular term. You know, many documents have those. But supposing I have a query which says the followed by uh, Saumen and Chakrabarti. Now, Saumen is not a very frequent word. It occurs in a number of web pages, but it is not very frequent. Chakrabarti is also not very frequent, maybe a little more frequent than Saumen. And the is the most frequent of all. So, the weightage is given to these terms where, you know, if a page is uh, say the is very important to the page, does not matter. The is of less importance overall to this query. Chakrabarti is uh, viewed as the most important, uh, sorry, Saumen is viewed as the most important if it is the uh, least frequent among all websites. Chakrabarti was a little more frequent, so it is considered slightly less important. So, that is the inverse document frequency. So, if very few documents have a term, give more importance to that term. Term is keyword are used synonymously. And the last thing, so these two predate the web. This last part came up purely because of the web, which is hyperlinks to a document. If there are more links to a particular web page, it is probably more important. That is the intuition. And those of you who are, fam are familiar with Google PageRank know that it is based on this concept. Of course, it adds a lot more to this. But at the core, this is what it is about. Important sites tend to have many links into them. So, the number of hyperlinks is a measure of the popularity or prestige of a site. Um, and uh, that is extended uh, for lack of time. I am not going to cover this slide in detail. Um, but the page rank algorithm uh, sets up a set of uh, linear equations and essentially solves them. Um, because the definition of a page rank is kind of circular. Um, it says that the rank of a page depends on the ranks of pages that point to it. But it is circular because this page may also point back to some of those pages. So, the ranks of those pages are defined in terms of ranks of this page. It is a circular definition, but that is not a big problem because it is a set of linear equations which can be solved. Yeah, this, this part is something which I mentioned briefly, information retrieval and structured data. So, there is a lot of work on information extraction. For example, uh, if you had a, a, an ad for a house or you had a resume of a person or something like that, you want to extract important attributes from that textual document. Extracting data from resumes is a big business actually. Uh, if you want to find the right person, the resume is textual, but from that if you can figure out that this person has expertise in these areas and has worked in these companies, uh, maybe I should look closely at that person. The extracted information could be stored as relations or XML and then keyword querying on this structured representation, which has been extracted from unstructured data is important, but you may also want to allow SQL or other similar querying on this thing. Uh, this slide says XML, but in recent years, uh, it should have updated this slide. In recent years, uh, XML has kind of vanished from this field, this is what is called RDF. RDF uh, stands for some resource description framework or something. Its original purpose was uh, to give metadata about web pages, but that is kind of irrelevant at this point. RDF is basically allows you to store information. You can think of it as a graph or as a set of triples such as um, you know, ID 221 name John and the same thing uh, address something or the other. So, essentially what you have done is you have an some kind of object identifier, then you have an attrib attribute name and a value. The value itself over here could be another object identifier. You can say parent or father or whatever, somebody else ID 101 or something like that. So, this is a way to 
represent data where you do not have a fixed schema, because you can keep throwing in new things here, at new attribute names can keep appearing and there is no specific relation name. So, this is a very flexible way of representing information when you do not have a schema. So, RDF has uh, taken off and there is a lot of RDF data out there. So, those of you who are interested in research, uh, this is a good topic to look at. Um, you know, there are a lot of data sources with RDF and there are interesting things you can do with it, ranging from query processing on RDF to data mining on RDF graphs to many, many other things, just because there are a lot of data sources and the structure is very rich. Okay, with that I will wrap up. So, that should be hearing college again. What is temporal database? What is temporal database? I briefly touched upon this uh, when I was talking of uh, relational uh, design. The idea is that uh, each fact may be true only for certain periods of time. Now, I am a professor here, but I was not always a professor here. I will not always be a professor here. You know, I will retire at some point. So, the uh, fact that I am a professor here is a fact now, but it has a time uh, duration, starting point and the ending point might be set to null currently, meaning it is going to continue till something happens. And that something happens might be my retirement or it might be uh, my leaving or whatever else. Okay, so, have a data which has a time period associated with it is called temporal data. And most data actually implicitly has a time period associated with it. Things do change. Not everything changes, but many things do change. Sometimes the time period is, uh, you know, from now to indefinite or from beginning to indefinite, uh, but things do change. So, temporal databases deal with many aspects of time in databases. One part is how does this affect schema design? The second part is how does this affect queries? Um, you know, maybe I, uh, if I do a join uh, between, let us say, um, students and teachers, uh, if uh, I was a teacher here from, say, I, I have been a teacher here from 95 somebody was a student here from earlier on, I did not have a connection with them, I did not overlap with them. Uh, so, the time might play a role in deciding what things are related when I run a query. Um, more directly, if I took a course, uh, its title and syllabus has a temporal aspect because it may change with time for a particular course ID. If I took a course and I want the syllabus and the material for the title of the course I took, you have to take the time when I took the course into account. So, there are many, many aspects. And then there is uh, temporal uh, efficiently uh, executing queries which involve temporal selections. Then temporal rule mining, I think Professor Sunita mentioned that earlier, uh, rules which change with time. So, there are many aspects uh, related to time in databases and, and in data mining. Uh, so, that is a very quick overview. There is a lot of material on this. There are books and plenty of stuff on this. Maulana Azad. Uh, actually, one slide was ex escaped yesterday, a JSON slide. So, I just wanted to ask question on JSON. Uh, sir, I was working with it, but I do not know how to pass dynamic values to the JSON string. So, that I wanted to know. Okay. So, the uh, first of all, I did not explain JSON. So, what is uh, JSON? Uh, so, JavaScript is a language. It has a notion of objects. And it is a very flexible kind of language. Um, it is a scripting language and many scripting languages tend to be very flexible. So, among the basic constructs in JavaScript is that you have an object. An object can have attributes. And the set of attributes that an object has can vary. You, you know, there is some kind of a type system, but uh, each object, uh, you could have untyped objects, each with its own set of attributes. So, when you store an object in JavaScript object notation, what you are doing is uh, essentially having an object identifier and within it, you have attribute names and values. So, you can think of it as name value pairs. Now, JavaScript uh, also has a concept of an array, but uh, and a map, both of which are actually internally the same thing, which is uh, that an attribute can be a map in itself, meaning that uh, given an object and an attribute name, and a value, it returns another object. So, what do I mean by this? 
supposing I had an object O1 and one of its fields could be an array. Okay. So, one of its fields is let us say uh, marks which is an array of 10. So, there are 10 marks, but internally uh, marks is basically what is called a map which takes a value and returns uh, another value. So, in this case the expected value are between uh, I think it's 0 to 9 or whatever. On the other hand the maps over here can be more general, it can take a value. So, I can even say um, marks of uh, let us say John, I could set it to 5 marks of Peter. 10 and so forth and I can create a you know anything else that I want marks of so many so forth. So, all of these is a basically a very very flexible types system and there is a, a string representation of this um, which lets you ship an object a JSON object uh, to uh, another system. There is no uh, direct notion of uh, pointers here, but you can create objects which have nested structure like this. Uh, so, this in turn could have further structure. So, there is a way of uh, serializing these JavaScript objects and shipping them over the network. So, this standard serialization format with a very flexible schema proved to be very useful for applications, even whether or not they used JavaScript. It became popular because uh, you know app uh, any, anything which runs on a browser today pretty much uses JavaScript and JSON is a great way for these uh, scripts to talk with a back end system, back end application. Uh, but subsequently JSON was even used for uh, storing data in for example, I talked about the peanuts system um, which is a key value data store and instead of creating their own schema uh, system they simply said we will store JSON objects. Uh, and then they can be interpreted and you can look for fields in them because it is a standard representation. So, that is what JSON is about. Now, coming to your question, uh, can you just repeat what your question was? Uh, I actually wanted to know how to pass dynamic values because whatever strings we have seen the value is written in quotes. So, that is all uh, like uh, the uh, constants we are giving. So, how can we pass dynamic values at that particular place in JSON string? Because so, I have used JSON with HTTP post, it is working, but dynamic values I am not able to give. Okay. Um, so, you want to do it from Java, you want to create a JSON string uh, thing from Java. Okay. So, I have not used the uh, JSON libraries in Java, so I am not sure the, of the exact interface, but I am uh, pretty sure it should not be too hard to do this, uh, but I cannot answer your question right away. Uh, so, the easiest thing is of course, to create a string and pass it if you already know it is in JSON form, but what you want is to create a structure and have it encoded as a JSON thing. So, there are uh, things which let you uh, convert from Java objects to JSON, XML to JSON uh, and so forth and you can probably create a JSON object, uh, there must be an API uh, to uh, create a, a JSON object, add fields to it and so on, just like the DOM tree. Uh, lets you uh, modify a HTML document, uh, there should be a similar API for JSON. I have not used it, so I am not 100 percent sure about it. Uh, the use of JSON I have looked at is mostly from within JavaScript, where the language itself supports it directly, uh, but if you are doing it from Java, there are APIs. That is the best answer I can give you. Sorry about that. Uh, sir, I have gone through your papers of parametric query optimization and uh, Picasso and IDEs and progressive query optimizations. So, I was wondering how uh, these changes can be made in optimizer because uh, here we cannot have access to optimizers of SQL Server and Oracle. So, how do you make changes in an optimizer? Okay, that is a good question. Uh, so, there are uh, two answers to that question. Uh, first of all, uh, if you want to do it to the PostgreSQL optimizer that code is very much available to you. You can put it into PostgreSQL, uh, but there are other options available. For example, uh, at IIT Bombay we built a uh, optimizer based on the volcano framework uh, a while ago around uh, 1998, 99 was when that was built. 
so that that code base is available. It's called the Pyro optimizer, and we have uh, more recently been rewriting it. Uh, it's now rewritten in Java, but it does a bunch of other stuff, incremental optimization and so forth. That stuff is not ready for release yet, but the original Pyro optimizer uh, written in C++ is available. So you can send me email, and I'll be happy to share a link to that. Uh, so these are two ways in which you can get at actual source. Now the uh, parametric query optimization stuff which uh, you talked about, um, that was actually built uh, into, partly into this optimizer, but also uh, partly done as a layer on top. So some of the work which uh, my then PhD student, Arvind Hulgeri did was, how to uh, do these things without going into the optimizer. Do it on top of an optimizer or with minimal changes to an optimizer. Uh, so I think that code might also be available if you're interested. I hope that answers your question. So send me email, I'll give you more information. Yes, sir. thank you, sir. Hello, sir. This is Sonma Mete from Chikam Engineering College. Yeah. Sir, I have a question on the cascading rollback. Sir, uh, let us assume a uh, DBMS system which implements concurrency control based on lock and a cascade rollback occurs, then in future course of time, how the system will regenerate the transaction in the same order as previous? So the answer is they don't. A simple answer is no. The system will just roll back. That's it. After that, uh, it's up to the user who launched the transaction to rerun it. Uh, this might sound, uh, you know, like a bad thing to be doing, but that's life. So what happens is uh, when you try to execute transaction on a database, it might just be rejected. So uh, sometimes you might see this happening. You don't see it happening very often because uh, the number of times, uh, you know, rollbacks are forced on you. Uh, first of all, uh, cascading rollbacks only happen if you um, read uncommitted data, which no database uh, allows. The default is the read committed. So unless you ask for it, you will not get uncommitted data. So cascading rollbacks won't happen. But rollbacks can happen for other reasons, but they are rare. And if they do happen, it's the job of whoever submitted the transaction to resubmit it. It's not the, the database will not take it upon itself to re-execute anything. Sir, I'm Abhijit Aich from Chikam Engineering College. Uh, I have got a question. That is, uh, can we customize the SQL queries? Because uh, I have seen that select star uh, from, from a particular table and all. Can I customize those particular query according to my uh, own choice? Is, is, is that possible in SQL? Yeah, customizing the queries. I mean, uh, say select. I want to use it as, say, S star from table. Can I do that? No, no. You can't change the language. The SQL language is defined. You can't go around uh, changing the keywords and so on. So that kind of uh, changes is not allowed. Sushila Hello. Tanchan, please go ahead. Yeah, it's on. I have go a ahead. general question, sir. Uh, like in uh, like in Oracle uh, 10G and 11G, G uh, means grid. Uh, in the same way, do we have in MySQL? Uh, MySQL supports uh, grid, sir. Grid or cluster. First question. Second, uh, like in data mining and data warehouse uh, in big uh, databases, whether MySQL is uh, uh, now used, and are there any real-time examples of MySQL? Thank you, sir. So first of all, uh, this business of grid and uh, G, I, and so on, which Oracle uses, is just marketing uh, blah, blah. Okay, Don't take any of that very seriously. Uh, what the hell is the grid? What was the grid? I have no idea. I mean, it's all marketing terms. Uh, so forget that. Now, if your question is, uh, you know, Oracle can be used in uh, maybe clusters, number of Oracle systems uh, working as a cluster so that uh, if one of them dies, the queries can go to the other. That's called uh, clusters. Um, so MySQL and other databases have also been used to build uh, various forms of clusters. Maybe not in exactly the same way that Oracle does. Uh, so what is this? I, I didn't get into this business of uh, database architectures. But there's something which Oracle calls clusters, which others call shared disk uh, parallel databases. And these are uh, pretty good for providing high availability by storing the disk outside of the database. And uh, the, if a database instance, so you have multiple database instances running off the same disk, if one of them fails, the other can continue to run. 
and take over the load. So, Oracle has a nice product on based on this technology. Uh, I do not know if MySQL has an equivalent product. So, this is good for high availability of one form. But these days, uh, many people who use high availability use a different form where the whole database is replicated somewhere else. And this kind of replication is supported today by uh, PostgreSQL. I'm, I know we, it has been used in a project uh, that I, I was involved in. Uh, MySQL, I think, also supports it. And of course, Oracle, SQL Server, DB2, they all have supported it for a very long time. Uh, so, that is a form of high availability, which is more commonly used these days. Although, the other one also has its uses. It, it is used widely even now. Uh, so, is MySQL used in live systems? Absolutely. I mean, there are any number of people who use MySQL, uh, any number of people who use uh, Postgres, Oracle, they are all widely used today. So, you do not have to worry about that. And there was a time when PostgreSQL and MySQL lacked high availability features. Today, even that is available. Uh, of course, there are still some benefits to using a commercial product like Oracle. Uh, the benefits have come down a little bit over the years, but yes, uh, there are some performance edges that it has and it has uh, features which uh, the other guys do not have. But if you need those features, then that is probably the right thing for you. If you do not need those features, then uh, you know one of the other uh, free ones may be good enough for you. I see you have another uh, question. Sir, according to you, uh, according to you, which is the best database, best commercial database? You want a contest, a beauty contest of databases? No, I, you can't uh, rank them as best and so on. Um, so e each one has its plus points and its minus points. Uh, if you want to uh, say what are the good things about uh, the commercial and uh, open source databases, I can tell you a few points. Uh, SQL Server, for example, its plus points are it has a really awesome optimizer. They, they do some really nice optimizations there and they can really optimize a query beautifully which others would struggle with even complex queries. So, uh, that is one of the nice things there. Another nice thing which they did is that uh, they uh, put a lot of features for simplifying database administration which used to be a big drawback for Oracle. Administering an Oracle system was a very tough job. It gave job security to Oracle DBAs, but uh, that is not necessarily what a uh, company wants. They want it to be easier to administer. SQL Server did a very good job of that. Uh, of course, Oracle has also done some work along those lines, but today, uh, you know, SQL Server is still easier to set up and administer than the others. Uh, open source, uh, you know, their biggest benefit is they are free. <laughs> that is a huge benefit. If you find, if you look at the costs of some of these other things, um, but some of them do have uh, some advantages too. Uh, PostgreSQL being open source, you can add to it, you can play around with it. People have added uh, features to PostgreSQL which you might find useful. I'll stop there. If you have any follow-up, ask. Uh, sir, uh, in MySQL, uh, in MySQL, I used that create index SQL clause. So, I do not get the what is the exact use of that create index SQL. So, how to use that create index and what is the use of that create index. So, it will create the index for your table. So, yeah. I did not get the exact use of that create index. Yeah. That is exactly the reason. It creates an index on the table. I mean, what is the point of an index to speed up access to the table. If I have a query which says find me a student with ID 21, I need an index, right. So, that is just the SQL uh, clause which lets you create the index. I mean, am I missing something in your question? I, I think that is all there is to it. How to use that index? When you write your SQL query, the index gets used automatically. I, okay, now I see what you are getting at. How does the index get used? So, you do not explicitly say use the index. You just write your SQL query and the optimizer uh, will choose the best way of executing that query. And if that index helps in executing your query, it will use it. And your uh, assignment of, uh, I think yesterday, right, uh, or day before, which was on query plans, that the, that's exactly what we did. We created an index, and then uh, the goal was to run some queries to see how the plan changed. And that's exactly where the you would see that the index is getting used. That was exactly the point of that assignment to see how indices get used and how they affect the time also. 
Okay. Any yes. data mining techniques uh, on software engineering documents like SRS? Okay. Like um, classification or clustering? I am sure people have looked at this. I know that um, software engineering is a good domain for data mining, especially with Indian companies having a lot of stuff. But I do not know the specific answers to the questions which you are asking for. Uh, I am not aware of work in that area. This is not my research area. So, you would have to look somewhere else for those answers. They are good questions, but I do not know the answers. The text to mining. So, you want uh, info, how to find more information on text mining? Yeah, so there is uh, this book by Professor Swamin Chakrabarti on uh, web mining. So, that has a fair amount of stuff on text mining. Uh, there is also another uh, book by Prabhakar Raghavan and Manning, which is available free online. So, let me just write this down. I will put it up on the Moodle page later. The other book, I do not remember the title, but it is by Manning and uh, I do not remember the spelling. I think that is the right spelling, Shulzerin. So, uh, these are two textbooks which uh, talk of uh, text mining. So, you can look up both of these. Second textbook is actually available free on the web. So, it is pretty easy to access. Yeah, uh, back to you. Uh, sir, what is the difference between uh, data mining and case? How can you find difference? Yeah, there is no real difference. Uh, they are just two terms which different people came up with, but they mean the same thing. So, uh, if you look at the top two conferences in the area, one is called knowledge discovery in databases. That is the name of one of the top conferences. The other top conference in the same area is called the uh, International Conference on Data Mining, ICDM. So, yeah, I mean, it is the same thing, there is no difference. Hello. Uh, IPS Academy Indore, please go ahead. Hello, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, may I ask the question for how soft computing technique using in data mining? How, is how soft computing technique using data mining? Okay. Sir. So, uh, this business of soft computing is a very fuzzy area. <laughs> I do not know much about the area. Uh, what I know is uh, too many people are writing too many papers uh, which use soft computing and fuzzy and so on uh, and that area is overworked. You know, it is time to move on to other areas uh, is my rough conclusion seeing the number of papers that are coming out in that area uh, which do not have a direct impact. The impact in the sense of how does it impact other areas. Um, so, certainly there is work in that area related to data mining, but uh, it is not an area I am familiar with and uh, maybe you should focus on uh, other areas which are having more impact in the real world. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this area has not had much impact in the real world except in some narrow domains. So, that is all I could say. Sir, which type of area? And you you have to say uh, like that other areas. Which type of we have taken other areas? So I uh, did mention uh, several areas in the course of the talks I had on research, and even through this workshop, uh, which are uh, uh, and there was also stuff on data mining. The uh, thing is that uh, we have given some links to conferences. So, if you go to those conferences and read papers, you will get an idea of what are the other areas. And I think this is an important question many people have, what area to work on. And uh, people get biased too much by areas which people that they know have worked on. Uh, that is not necessarily the best way to pick an area to work on. What happens is uh, something becomes a fashion and you know it might have made sense initially, but when too many people work on it, there is not much left uh, to do which is new. Everyone is doing the same thing over and over. and it gets very boring. Uh, so, what you want to do is uh, find new areas and one way to do it 
is to look at uh, papers in uh, recent conferences. Uh, in particular, the conferences which are uh, regarded as good conferences in the area. So, things which have an impact often appear in those conferences. So, I have given a few links to conferences in databases and data mining. So, you can uh, go in there and read papers, find things which appeal to you. Instead of reading the paper, uh, many of these conferences now provide slides from talks also. So, it is easier to go read the slides first to get an overview of what the paper is about. Reading a paper takes a lot more effort. So, if you can get the slides, read those first, get an overview, then pick an area which looks interesting to you, then read more in that area. And the first area you pick may not be the right area. You know, you might realize that uh, it assumes a lot of background, let us say probability and statistics, which you do not know enough about. So, then you might say, okay, I do not want to look at this area, I will go somewhere else. But that is one way to look for areas. There are many other ways, this is one way. D Y Patel, please go ahead. Hello. Whenever we are loading images on any social site, so what will be the uh, phenomenon they are doing while loading our images on their server and how they are maintaining all this database? Okay. So, the question is where do they store these images? So, first of all images are usually stored as files, not inside of a database and they have a, a typically a very big uh, files, distributed file system in each data center and they have many data centers. So, your image will typically be stored in a few of the data centers for redundancy and um, that is it. Uh, it is stored in the file system somewhere and the database will simply create, store a pointer, uh, an identifier for that image. So, it can be retrieved later on uh, from whichever copy is alive at a point in time. So, uh, my question is related with the business intelligence uh, tools uh, that is uh, related with, you have said once uh, Pentaho. So, any demonstration regarding this or how to use and uh, just working with it, uh, it's where it is available and uh, can you provide the uh, demo on it? Can I provide a demo? No, I mean, uh, I have not uh, used it myself. Uh, I know it is used, I, I know many people have used it, uh, but I have not used it myself. But it's available for download, so it should be relatively straightforward to uh, download and set it up. And I am pretty sure uh, that company has given uh, documentation to help you get started with it. So, what I would suggest is just go, go to the website, download it, read their uh, manuals, understand how to use it and uh, that should do. I do not think it is very hard to use. L R Tiwari, Mira Road. Sir, you are uh, just uh, in a short while from now, you are saying something about the resource. So, my question is regarding to that only, uh, how to encourage or promote postgraduate students, MCA students or M especially MTech students to participate more and more in, in research or uh, innovation or these kind of activities, which has a direct impact on society, most importantly, as we are in the professional studies. So, how to encourage students so that they can do something to uh, get the reflection on society? Okay. Uh, that is a good question. Uh, there is no simple answer to that. Uh, this is something which we are all trying to do all the time. Uh, so, I cannot say I have the solution, the final solutions, but there are a few things which uh, do work here, which different faculty here have uh, found to work in different ways. Uh, one thing is, uh, if you want to do more academic research uh, and publish papers and so on, uh, the best way is to have courses where you study papers, you, know, you run a course. Uh, like the CS632 course which I run and every faculty member in IIT more or less runs a similar course um, which focuses on research in a particular area or a sub area and exposes students to lots of research, lo read, make them read lots of papers. When they read a lot of papers, a certain maturity comes in and uh, then they get ideas on what to do. At the beginning, they have no clue about an area. It is very important to read lots of papers and the best way is to teach a course where a lot of papers are read. Now, uh, you know, many times I end up reading a lot of new papers in why, when I teach that course. Um, so, that is good for me also in the sense it is not that I need to have read all the papers up front. I want to learn an area. One of the best ways is to teach a course in that area. In this case, you know, this is a paper oriented course. So, uh, it is a joint learning students and I will read some new papers and uh, when I teach it, I will get questions or uh, I also make students present the papers uh, which they have read and uh, so as they present it, you know, things, some things become more clear. 
So, that is a good joint learning exercise to do with students to actually teach a course like this. If you have that flexibility, you should do it. Uh, and that really seeds an area. Then after that, things become a lot more clear. Uh, the other part was uh, social relevance. Uh, now, it is hard to combine uh, these two things, you know, social relevance and publication do not necessarily go hand in hand. If you can combine it, fantastic, uh, but uh, they are kind of orthogonal. Uh, so, if the goal is social relevance, there are other ways uh, which other faculty have used to motivate students. So, they pick projects which uh, you know they believe will have a social impact. So, I, uh, some colleagues of mine here work on technology for rural areas and uh, others work on, uh, Professor Fatak has worked on affordable computing and so forth. Uh, where the goal is not publication, but the goal is to build tools which uh, people can use. Um, and that also motivates other students. You know, there are students who get motivated by one, some by the other. Mm. So, both are valid ways and valid things to do. And it is very good to do at least one of these. It could be social, it could even be building products, it does not have to be research. It could be build a product which people might use, which you might even be able to May, may not be sell right away, but it could form the basis of something you would sell. So, it is always good to have students motivated to do something rather than just come, uh, you know, uh, take some courses, write some exams and go, you know, that is not satisfying. There should be something more than that. And we try to do that with our students. It does not always work. Some students lap it up and do a fantastic job. Some students, uh, you know, do not bother, they, they do not put in effort. It varies. Ah, there is just one last question hanging. So, I will take that very, very last question. And I see a lot of people waiting there. I am glad I took this question. Uh, Savita College, please go ahead. You will be the last people to ask uh, questions in this workshop. Sir, good afternoon, sir. First of all, I thank for the excellent uh, presentation, sir. My question is I am doing my research in medical diagnostics. Sir. So, in that, I am handling multivariate data. So, my question is, uh, is there any tool for handling multivariate data? Because I have to do a lot of uh, experiments based on this multivariate data analysis. So, my question is, the first question is, is there any tool for multivariate data? The second question is, what is the role of big data analysis in medical prediction? This is prediction system. These are the two questions, sir. Two very good questions. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I am not an expert in this area. So, your first question, I have absolutely no idea about the answer. Um, so, I, I do not really work in data mining or I have not done anything with multivariate data. So, unfortunately, I do not have any answer to your first question. Uh, the second question, uh, uh, you know, I, but bottom line is I think medical uh, diagnosis is a fantastic area, you know, this is a wonderful area to work in. Um, the big problem usually is getting data, but as our hospitals get more computerized, uh, you will get better and better access to data. So, it is a good field to be in for the future. Uh, and your question was the role of big data in this. Uh, there have been some interesting things uh, which people have done. Uh, for example, uh, Google has used uh, search logs to decide if, you know, a particular disease, flu is spreading in an area. When people start typing flu, it is possible that it is because there is a flu epidemic going on. It could also be because a news program talked about a flu epidemic, not because there is actually a flu epidemic. Um, so, uh, they need to differentiate between these kinds of things. The problem here is getting access to this kind of data. It is a little harder. Now, there are some sources which many researchers use. For example, Twitter data is easy to get access to. And many people have done uh, analysis on Twitter data. Uh, in the Indian context, I do not know how many people use Twitter. I do not think it, 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 obviously people are using it. We do hear of some ministers who use Twitter. Uh, but is it popular enough uh, to make sense to do data analysis on this? I do not know. It might be. If not today, it might be tomorrow. Uh, so, that, that would be, an, if it takes off, it is definitely big data because there is a lot of Twitter posts, a huge number. So, if you can use this to analyze and uh, make a conclusion, good. But again, I am not convinced that Twitter is necessarily the right thing here. You know, are people going to Twitter that I am down with flu, I have jaundice, you know, I do not think so. Uh, maybe they will, but I do not know the answer to this. Um, but if you had actual 
medical data from hospitals, uh, you know, medicine sales of medicines and so on. That could be a wonderful predictor of what is happening. Uh, it is something which we need badly in India. Uh, it happens informally, you know, doctors see that uh, disease is going around and when they see somebody with a symptom, they tend to believe that it is that disease which was diagnosed. So, the diagnosis in one patient helps the next patient. Can you scale this up across large numbers of people? If you can, it would be great. So, uh, you know, I, I hope you work in this area and do some good stuff. Uh, but I do not know enough about the area to help you too much on that. Even uh, after big data analysis, uh, I am doing the prognosis uh, steps also. Sir. So, based on the uh, past data, we are predicting the uh, um, disease of the future right. for the future generation. So, that's what, that is the uh, motive of the question, sir. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. With that, we will wrap up the workshop. Okay.